Thanks very much, um, <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> um, right, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to be here. Um, so um, I think I'm programmed to talk for like uh, 30 minutes. I've got a wee clock here. There we go. Uh, right, um, land reform. So this is a big topic. Um, the, uh, the, the singer at the beginning, what was her name? Siobhan. Siobhan. Siobhan said they shouldn't have any land reform songs. Then she starts singing a song about mining, <laughs> which is all about minerals and land and uh, who's got the rights over, over minerals and stuff. Um, so, I mean, land affects us all. Uh, it's a big topic. And um, in half an hour, I can't really do it all justice. So what I'm going to try and do is just kind of give you a flavour of why, why this subject matters to, to all of us. Uh, I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of kind of context. Um, a second, go into a little bit of history, about how we got here. Uh, third, cover three, just three issues, uh, the commons, housing and taxation. And then do a wee bit of a kind of democracy and European uh, examples uh, and lessons. And then finish off with some kind of current issues uh, and challenges. So, to kick off um, and, and to remind us all that uh, land is... It's not just a rural thing, it's, a, it's an urban thing, as we've just experienced with Chris's work uh, and his film. And also it's a, it's a marine thing. So I don't know if you can see this sort of uh, dark blue uh, area around the coast of Scotland. These are Scotland's territorial waters, and they're legally part of Scotland, out to the 12-mile limit. Um, and so, a wee factoid for tonight, 54% uh, of Scotland is underwater. Um, and then the, 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 the sea areas, the 200 mile limit is the, yellow, is the yellow line, which is an exclusive economic zone. And all of that is governed by the Crown Estate Commissioners. It's all Crown land and it's all going to be devolved and we're going to have responsibility collectively for deciding how to manage that. Um, so that's a big task, in fact, half the foreshore, the seabed, uh, etc. So land is urban, land is rural uh, and land is uh, marine. And I just thought I'd begin just by declaring some interests. I don't own any land in Scotland. Uh, I don't own any land and I don't own a house. I don't own any land on planet Earth, but I do own some land on the moon, uh, which I bought about 10 years ago now. I've got an, um, an acre of land in um, the Oceanus Procellarum. And um, I use this with students to start off a discussion about, you know, who really owns land. Do I, do I really own this land on the moon? Um, I, I'm not sure if I do, but the critical thing is, of course, that if I were ever to try and defend my rights to this land on the moon, um, it'd, be, it'd be hard to do so. Uh, but this isn't just a kind of a, a light-hearted remark. In fact, uh, space is the new frontier for land grabbing. After the uh, Second World War, during the Cold War, we signed the UN Treaty on Outer Space, the Outer Space Treaty. And the Outer Space Treaty governs the management of outer space, and amongst other things, it prohibits the militarization of space. That's why it was passed, really. Uh, during the Cold War, we thought we were, you know, we were bad enough at threatening to destroy each other on Earth, never mind putting nuclear weapons in space. So it was principally driven by a desire by the two superpowers then to, to make sure that space wasn't militarised. But it also prevents, it prohibits states from taking any claims to ownership of any celestial bodies. So the person that sold me this acre in the moon, of course, is a chap called uh, Dennis Hope. And he's described here as the... Oh, no, this was actually Francis Williams, the Lunar Ambassador to the United Kingdom, uh, who sold me this. And, of course, um, of course, individuals like you and I are, are not bound by the UN Treaty because we didn't sign it. It was only signed by states. But actually, it's now under challenge because there are big US corporations who now want to explore space. And indeed, NASA have, um, are leasing one of the launch pads at Cape Canaveral to the private sector. And there's a company called SpaceX, which... Um, some years ago, uh, registered title to an asteroid called Eros. And when NASA sent a probe, the Schumacher probe, uh, to go to Eros and do some science and send back some data, uh, and then the batteries died on the Schumacher probe after it had done its work, and Schumacher is still sitting on Eros, uh, SpaceX then sent an invoice to NASA uh, for parking charges, saying this was... <laughs> This was their asteroid, and, um, and it, it throws open questions about ownership in space because there are 
asteroids, for example, with more precious metals like titanium and lithium on them than exist in vast tracts of planet Earth. So this is the next frontier uh, for land grabbing, uh, and we should be aware. Anyway, going back a wee while, going back to the future, in fact, 1985, um, I was at university in Aberdeen studying forestry, and at that time they were reforesting the so-called flow country uh, in Caithness and Sutherland, and this was a tax break that rich people in London were doing. And when I was a student, I kind of wondered, the, the chief executive of the company that was doing this came and gave a talk to us, and I asked him, why is the government giving millions of pounds in tax breaks to rich people in London to buy land in Caithness to plant trees? Why don't you just give that same amount of money that you're foregoing in tax revenue to the landowners and the farmers and the crofters in Caithness? And they could plant the trees. And I don't remember what the answer was, but afterwards my professor pulled me to one side and said he didn't think it was a good idea to ask such politically sensitive questions. Um, and I didn't know, I was just a naive laddie, but I quickly realised that when you start asking questions about land and power and money, some people get uncomfortable. And um, that was a great that was a great feeling, and I enjoyed making people feel uncomfortable, so I've kept on doing it. Um, but it began in me kind of asking some questions about, you know, who owns Scotland. And the fact that there is a debate about land there is a debate about the fact that so few people own so much of it, about how great tracts of land are bought and sold on the international property market, how little involvement or scrutiny this is, uh, 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 how little, little scrutiny is applied to such, to such land sales. And it's been a political issue off and on for uh, decades, indeed, 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 indeed centuries. Um, so, but it's also important at a much, much more fundamental um, level when Gordon Brown became Chancellor in 1997 in his very first budget, uh, he said, I will not allow house prices to get out of control. And we'd been through in the early 90s a big housing boom and crash. And um, of course, when he left as Chancellor in, 19, in 2007, house prices had uh, tripled. Um, he also said, I think in the same budget, no return to boom and bust. Uh, our current Chancellor, George Osborne, he went to Dublin in 2006 and gave a lecture in Trinity College um, and said that Ireland stands as a shining example of the art of the possible in long-term economic policymaking. That turned out well. Um, and it just shows you that people who are meant to be, people who indeed are in charge of the economy, don't understand the fundamental role that land plays. Because, in fact, in Ireland, as the Financial Times noted, uh, at the height of what it called the lunacy, around three quarters of the total lending by Irish banks, 420 billion or about two and a half times the size of the Irish economy, got bound up in property construction and land speculation of one sort or another, a sort of northern rock on steroids. <laughs> because, of course, people were speculating on land. And, of course, that's what started the financial crash, was the subprime mortgages in America, where people were speculating on the rising value of land and people would be able to buy it, package these mortgages up as financial instruments, sell them around the world. And then, of course, the whole Ponzi scheme uh, collapsed. So how you manage land is actually fundamental to the future of whole economies. It's also uh, important in terms of culture. When I was in Aberdeen as a student, I had the good fortune to meet this lady in the top right um, called Jean Bain. Jean died in 1994. Uh, but what was interesting about Jean was Jean was the last native speaker of Deeside Gaelic. Now, that's a farm there in the top left overlooking Loch Nagar, those of you who know uh, Deeside. And so when Jean died in 1994, Deeside Gaelic as a language was dead. It had gone forever. It was a very interesting language because the Cairngorms provided a bit of an inhibition on movement, uh, so there wasn't much cross-fertilisation between Eastern Highland Gaelic and Western Highland Gaelic. And of course it was infused by, by Doric uh, as well. And her son Rob Bain in the bottom right there, uh, he died in 2004. Um, and then the, uh, her farm was put on the international property market. Now there's no other country in Europe that this would happen to. And it just shows you the impact of, for example, the 1886 Crofting Act, which was passed to protect and give tenants security of tenure in what was meant to be all of Scotland, but in fact was restricted at the time to the seven crofting counties. And uh, it was principally because of that, the fact that it wasn't applied to Aberdeenshire, that meant that people like Jean Bain and her predecessors never had the security of tenure uh, that they had in the rest of Scotland. And the long-term impact of that 150 years later was the death of a language. So the way we kind of manage land relations has fundamental impacts uh, on our, our culture. So how did we get here? Well, in my book, I uh, talk about six land grabs. Uh, the first was feudalism, the introduction of feudalism, not by this chap, although he fought, he fought for it. Um, and that gave the crown, that gave the king or the queen 
with complete ownership. The Crown gave complete ownership over the whole country, uh, and they, then they could, they could uh, hand out feudal charters uh, to, their, to, to their friends. And that eliminated a lot of native systems uh, of land tenure. So that was the first sort of land grab. The second, which is not much talked about, uh, took place in the 16th century during the lead up to the Reformation in Scotland. We had a, a late Reformation in 1560. And that's when the, the nobility uh, got themselves in as commendators, who were the chief executives of the abbeys, um, and they slowly granted over the lands of the church in life rent to their, to their friends and then converted them to few. So over a period of about 30, 40 years, vast tracts of very valuable land held by the old church uh, were appropriated by the nobility uh, in Scotland. The third land grab was a very kind of quiet affair in the 17th century, the last time we had a Scottish Parliament. It spent most of its time legislating to protect the interests of uh, landed proprietors. Uh, 1617, it set up the Register of Seasons, the property uh, register to allow people to record their property rights. Uh, passed the Act of Prescription, which meant that if you had a recorded title and no one challenged it for what was then 40 years, then it became beyond challenge. Uh, passed the Law of Entail, which meant you could freeze your assets uh, from uh, creditors. So whilst creditors could get hold of your movable assets, they couldn't get hold of your land. Laws of inheritance were tightened up to insist that only the eldest male son inherited, uh, etc. So a whole regime of property rights that buttressed the interest of the nobility were passed in the 17th century. And it culminated in 1695 with an act to divide the commons in Scotland. And that was the fourth land grab, because these were large areas of land held in common in every Scottish parish. And by one act of Parliament, any landowner could apply to the courts and divide them amongst the heritors in the parish. And in England, of course, the acts of enclosure, plural, uh, were acts that had to be passed for each uh, common and hence took a lot of time. And that's why in England today there are approaching three quarters of a million acres of land still in common uh, and very, very little left in Scotland. Uh, the fifth land grab was um, in Scotland's towns and cities, the, the royal boroughs. Uh, these were exempt from the Division of, of Commonties Act. These were valuable areas of land. But they quickly became prey to rampant municipal nepotism and corruption, principally because in the 15th century we abolished primitive democracy in Scotland's towns and a law was passed to insist that town councils selected their own successors um, and together sat down and appointed the officers of the borough. So from 1472 or thereby to 1833, um, Scotland's royal boroughs were, were governed by a, a nepotistic elite uh, who slowly stole a lot of the common uh, good land this is celebrated today, of course, still in places like the Borders and the Common Riding Festival, where they literally ride round the marches of the town's lands. Historically, this was to protect the town's lands and make sure that uh, the nobility didn't get their, their hands on it. Uh, places like St Andrews, um, through rampant municipal nepotism and corruption, went bankrupt in the late 18th century. Their valuable common lands, which today, of course, are the very, very famous golf uh, links, uh, they decided to lease them out to a rabbit farmer to try and generate some income for the town, Mr. Dempster. Um, and, of course, the people in town still had the right to play golf because that's an ancient right over the common. But these rabbits, of course, bred people. They, bred, they were bred for food. Um, but quickly, their 18-hole golf, golf courses turned into 50-hole golf courses and new bunkers appeared. Um, and there were what were called the rabbit wars, where the rabbit wardens were physically attacked and uh, blood was spilt. Uh, legal cases were taken all the way to the... House of Lords, and eventually the whole matter was settled in the early 19th century. But so throughout the 19th century, Scotland's towns were the focus of a lot of uh, litigation around uh, common uh, land. A sixth land grab was, of course, we ran out of land in Scotland and we went overseas and stole other people, co people's countries. And that was quite easy. Um, Captain Cook, who ostensibly was on a, a scientific expedition to observe the transit of Venus from Tahiti, that was his purpose of the voyage. Also carried with him secret instructions from the Admiralty to, to colonise any land that hadn't already been colonised. So when he landed in what is now called Queen's Land, um, he literally hoisted a Union flag and uh, fired a 21-gun salute and declared Queensland British. And then, of course, the whole of Australia uh, became, became British. And in that process, uh, not only did we steal a whole country, uh, but we also declared it terra nullius, in other words, no man's land. Uh, so the legal idea was that there was nobody in Australia before we arrived, which, of course, is a total fiction. But it didn't take... It took till the 1990s before this man on the left here, uh, called um, Eddie Mabel, decided he would take the state of Queensland to court. OK, 
because the state of Queensland were trying to appropriate a bit of his ancestral land to build a, I don't know, an airport or a school or something. And I said, no, no, this is my land. And of course, he came up with it against this buttress of legal opinion that this was all terra nullius and Aboriginal land rights didn't exist. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he, he fought through the courts, went all the way to the Supreme Court in Australia and uh, eventually won. And the court ruled that the land in the Murray Islands is not crown land and that the Merriam people are entitled against the whole world to possession, occupation, use and enjoyment of the lands of the Murray Islands. So this ended 250 years of legal fiction um, and is still having repercussions around the, the so-called new world and just shows that laws that were passed some time ago are open to quite fundamental challenge today, which is always quite encouraging. So after that brief history, uh, where are we today? I just want to talk about a few instances um, of uh, common land, housing uh, and tax very briefly. Um, this is an instance I was working on some years ago uh, in the hill of Ayloth. This was a, a common land in eastern Perthshire. Had never been divided, but when the Earl of Airlie decided to sell the farms around the hill to the tenant farmers, he decided to split up the hill and sell bits of land to the tenants, even though, of course, he didn't own it. The tenants knew he didn't own it, but were quite happy to take a bit of land. And after the war, when we started giving grants to farmers to secure food supply, they started erecting fences. And at that point, the townspeople in Ayloth realised something was up. Their land had been stolen. So they had marches up on the hill where they exercised their ancient right to feel and divot. And they cut divots and peats along in, uh, rather than in square patches, as was their usual wont. They, they cut them in long, long strips, thin strips, directly underneath the line of the fences, which, of course, slowly collapsed. And then the following Friday, one of the town councillors went up and he actually cut the fence. That was an act of criminal damage. There was a court case. There were questions in Parliament, etc. And that whole debate about the Hill of Ayleth rumbled on, as many cases did in Scotland, rumbled on quietly without much public attention beyond Ayleth until 1975 when we abolished local government in Scotland and the people in Ayleth no longer had a town council to stand up for their rights, legal officers, money, political power, etc., uh, and the whole issue has, in effect, uh, died. Another issue I was uh, engaged in is in uh, closer to here in, in Lanarkshire, North Lanarkshire. This is the King's Law above Curluck in the parish of Curluck. And I was looking at land ownership here for a purpose that needn't detain us. Uh, but I found this area of land in yellow in the middle, which is a, a piece of land that was recorded as, as common, which was, which was quite interesting. So I contacted the people in Curluck, Curluck Parish Historical Society, asked them if they knew they had a commentary in their parish. They said they didn't. Um, this was particularly interesting because at the time, indeed now, it is in the middle of what was then Europe's largest onshore wind farm, the Black Law Wind Farm. Um, and this is a map showing the turbines and the electrical cabling. So I phoned up Scottish Power and asked them why there was no uh, turbines had been erected on this piece of common land. And they said that they didn't know who would sign the lease, which indeed is an interesting legal question. Uh, but because the folk in Curluck were ignorant of the fact they owned this land, they weren't in a position to negotiate uh, to put a turbine on it. So this is the land today. We eventually, after five years, secured a title to it. But these are examples of how across Scotland there are lots of bits of land about which people have forgotten, about which people are, generally speaking, ignorant, about which we, in general, are ignorant, uh, and we need to stop being uh, ignorant. The second topic I want to briefly touch on is, is housing, which is a a critical component, this is to do with land, because you have to build houses on land. And this is a very interesting graph produced in a very interesting paper called A Right to Build by an architect called Alistair Parvin two, three years ago, showing that from the post-war period from 1946 to about 1970, 1980, we built a lot of houses in Britain, in the private sector and in the public sector, the local authorities in red there. And during that time, house prices didn't really increase at all. They kept very steady. Housing was very affordable. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, for example, uh, an average building worker could buy a house for uh, three and a half times their annual salary. But then from about 1970s, 1980s onwards, house building has fallen away. But of course, house prices, which is the line on the right, uh, have, have, have shot up. And this is just showing about how a UK building worker in 1930 could buy a house for three and a half times their average salary. Uh, now it's seven and a half times. It's virtually unaffordable. And not only that, but in 1930, the land component of housing was only about 5% of the cost. So we built very, very good quality housing because most of the money we spent was actually spent on building a good quality house. Uh, now you're up to 40, 50, even 60% is the land, which, of course, is completely unproductive. It doesn't, you know, you can't build good land. It's just a site. 
Uh, there's less money to go in the house, and it means that people are vastly indebted to banks for stuff that's not really worth anything. And this is principally because most housing in Britain is built by volume house builders, and they compete in the first instance to get hold of land. So the developer who wins in the land war, as it were, is the person who gets to build the houses. In this example, this is developer two, wins the land war. And they're the one who bids most for the land. Now, of course, when you go to sell your houses, you can only sell them at the average house in the local market. Uh, so the total price you can get for a house is, broadly speaking, fixed. So if you spent a lot of money on the land, it means you've got less money to put in building houses. Uh, and so build quality gets squeezed, affordable gets squeezed, profit doesn't. And that's why new housing in Britain is some of the worst in Europe, um, smallest housing in Europe, um, and some of it's got a design life of 40 or 50 years, principally because of the way we build houses and because of the role that land plays. And it's why places like Germany, for example, in blue there, that's the house price index in Germany uh, versus the house price index in the UK. And that's part of the reason why Germany does so well, because it doesn't pour vast amounts of money uh, into, into, into land, into speculating on housing. Uh, it actually, you know, the, 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 the people in Germany invest their money in the local banks, they save, and that gets invested in business and industry, and that creates jobs and exports for the German economy. We spend all our money on shopping and housing, uh, which just consumes and gets us into debt, um, and is uh, causing a big problem for us. And it's not that we can't build good quality housing. Uh, there are companies like Hebridean Homes who build you a very high quality house for about 70 or 80,000 uh, pounds. The problem, the problem is the land. Land is very expensive. And uh, the Financial Times, in fact, in January, which is a, a paper I now read more often, uh, in its leader column, actually said that the politics of building more houses is as tortuous as the economics is clear, that the current state of affairs cannot be allowed to continue. What Britain needs is a government brave enough to trumpet the virtue of falling house prices and to make it happen. And this, of course, is related to questions about tax, how we tax property, how we tax land. Uh, some of you may remember this fire in Morrison Street, at the south end of the Kingston Bridge, I think. Somebody nod two or three years ago. Um, I kind of a, a sad character, and when these things happen, I often wonder who owns this land. So I, I went on to the land registry and found out it was owned by a company called Straban Developments Limited in Belfast, who bought it in 2003. And what was interesting about this property, it was an old co-op warehouse building. And because it was an empty industrial building, for whatever reason, we give it 100% relief from non-domestic rates. The rateable value of this building is about £450,000. So in a normal circumstances, this building would be paying about £200,000 a year in non-domestic rates. So over 10 years during which they owned it, that's £2 million of tax, which they haven't paid to Glasgow City Council, because we, in our wisdom, have decided that industrial, empty industrial buildings shall be given 100% rates of relief. And yet the owner of this building when it goes on fire, still expects the fire brigade to come and put the fire out, expects the police to maintain civil order, expects the courts to be available to adjudicate on any liability or claims or insurance. In other words, everyone who owns property relies on the services of the state to protect their property. Ultimately, they, they rely on the army and the navy and the air force to defend the country uh, in, the effect of, in the event of, a, of an invasion. And it underlines why we have to think about how we tax land, because it's got a uh, a very important role in how land is then used. So this building now is sitting as a vacant site, and of course vacant land is off the vote, off the elect, off the electoral roll, off the valuation roll completely, and is sitting there doing absolutely nothing. And that's one of the issues we need to tackle, especially in places like Glasgow, where um, over 50% of the vacant and dust derelict land in Scotland is within 500 metres of the 10% most deprived communities uh, in in Scotland. And part of this as well is about democracy and how much control we have over land and the environment in our own areas. And this is where European experience is quite instructive. In countries like France and Spain, they have genuine local uh, democracy. Uh, we have the most concentrated pattern of local democracy anywhere in Europe. We only have 32 councils. Sweden has 290. A country like Belgium has 589. Norway, 431. Germany, 12,000 local municipalities, with populations typically around five to 10,000. And these municipalities are responsible for a lot of the affairs in local, in local communities. Now, we used to have parish councils up until 1930. We used to have town councils, as I said, until 1975, but we got rid of all them. And that hollowing out of local democracy, that hollowing out of local power, is partly why I think we have failed to tackle the land question. 
So if you take an example of Fife, for example, up till 1894, had 26 councils, then parishes were put in a statutory footing, uh, 82, then they were abolished, down to 33, then the town councils were abolished, down to four, then the region was abolished, down to one. You can see where this is going. There are politicians in Scotland, some of them in power, who would actually quite like to centralise all the councils and just run everything from Edinburgh. And I think one of the most serious issues we've got to deal with in the next parliament is the state of our local democracy. Because in countries like Norway, for example, this is a Hemsdal commune, a population of 2,200. They pay 28% income tax in Norway. 12.8% uh, of that goes straight to the commune. So in a meeting like tonight uh, in Hemsdal commune, there'd be two or three people in the audience here who are councillors to whom I've paid half my income tax and to whom all of you have paid half your income tax. Um, and that builds quite a degree of trust and accountability for how your tax uh, taxes are, are spent. And also across Europe, we have a very pluralistic pattern of land ownership. I was doing a study of forest ownership a number of years ago. And if you look at the pattern of private forest ownership in Scotland, uh, almost half of all the private forest land in Scotland is owned in land holdings of over 100 hectares on the top graph there. And it's the mirror opposite in Europe. 60% of Europe's forests are owned in holdings of less than a hectare. And that's a history of 200 years, a reflection of a history of 200 years of very, very different land law. Most significantly, inheritance law, because children have legal rights to inherit land in most European countries, whereas they don't uh, in Scotland. And it leads to some fairly bizarre uh, situations. I was looking at Danish land taxes a couple of years ago, and I found that Dan Danes pay land taxes, but they also pay on land they own outside Denmark. Um, so I phoned up the SCAT, who are the Danish tax authorities, uh, who were running a campaign at the time to get Danes to declare land they owned outside Denmark and asked them how many Danes they had on their books who declared land in the United Kingdom. And uh, I can't remember exact figures, but it was around 58. And I said, well, you've probably got 58 Danes in one London borough alone. Um, you've got 400,000 acres of land in Scotland owned by Danes. Um, and I'm quite happy to go into some kind of profit share with you to help you identify these. Um, and the bizarre thing is that people like Mr. Paulson on the top right, who's now one of Scotland's biggest landowners, who owns 190,000 acres of land. I'm sure he's paying his land taxes. He's the only one in Scotland who will be, because we don't, agricultural land's been exempt from land tax since the 1950s. Um, so he, but he's, he's paying tax. Uh, the irony is, of course, instead of paying it to Perth and Kinross Council or Aberdeenshire Council, he's paying it to his home municipality of Esbjerg to build beautiful kindergartens for children in Esbjerg in the bottom right. So just to conclude, land is back on the agenda. Um, the Scottish Affairs Committee had a, did a good inquiry last Parliament into it. The Scottish Government set up the Land Reform Review Group that published a report in 2014. Land reform is about changing the relationship between society and land, all land. It's about the legal relationship, so things like the private rented sector. Uh, there's a bill going through Parliament to reform private renting for housing. Uh, it's part of land reform because it's about changing the legal relationship between occupiers and landlords. It's about fiscal relationship, taxation, as I've touched on, and it's about the political relationships, about governance and who makes decisions uh, about land. So there's a lot going on just now. There's a bill going through Parliament dealing with things like setting up a Scottish Land Reform Commission. Um, Non-domestic rates on shootings are getting reintroduced. Private rented sectors, say, agricultural holdings legislation. Uh, there's a local tax commission reporting in November on the future of the council tax. There's reforms suggested to inheritance law, the law commission is looking at compulsory purchase, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the Crown estate powers are going to get devolved. So there's quite a lot happening on the land uh, reform agenda. And what we really need to have is a vision of how we want to own and govern land in Scotland, because ultimately it is, belongs to all of us. And that's a vision that can be informed by the experiences in other European countries. So for example, Germany again, uh, they have things called Schrebergarten. They're the, their equivalents of our allotments. And where our allotments are restricted to 250 square metres and you're allowed a building of no more than, I don't know, 10 square metres to have your rakes and your spades in and you're not allowed to stay overnight. German Schreber Gardens, you can stay from the 1st of April to the end of September. Um, they're 2,500 square metres. Uh, they're beautiful places. That the family lives here. All the kids live here all summer. Uh, the aunts and uncles, the grannies and grandpas all come out. Um, and this is a civilised way of living for people who live in big densely populated uh, German cities, and this is the kind of thing we should be doing in and around great cities like 
Glasgow. We shouldn't have the blight of derelict land. We shouldn't even have the blight of a green belt, I would say, which is actually um, a piece, piece of land virtually doing nothing. That there should be places where we can grow fruit, where we can have huts, where we can have forests, where we can have shrubber garden, where we can go for walks, where we can cycle, uh, etc. It's about ending the scourge of land-owned and offshore tax havens, which is one of the campaigns we've got running in the Scottish Parliament. There's a piece of land in Leith, uh, which after the housing crash in 2008, has ended up as somebody's stranded asset, and it's now parked in the, in the British Virgin Islands. We've no idea who owns it. Uh, and of course, it's not liable to any, any taxation. And finally, uh, I grew up in a wee place called Kinross. This is the town hall in Kinross 10 years ago when I last went to town Kinross. When I grew up, Kinross was quite a lively place. Town Hall was a regular focus of events. The library next door was a place I went to when I was a schoolboy. Um, this is now derelict, empty, riddled with dry rot. Um, and the community in Kinross had to fight for five years through the courts to get Perth and Kinross to admit that this property belonged to them. This was part of their common good. And it really stands as an allegory today how, about how power has been hollowed out of our communities and we've lost significant amounts of influence in how land is owned and governed. And that's the challenge uh, for all of us in the years ahead, is to change that. Thank you very much. Thank you.